We're in the midst of an Advent series, as you know. We are focusing on the, the incarnation, which is a fancy Christian word that simply means that God the Son became man. He took on flesh. He didn't stop being God, but he started being man. That's what we celebrate. It's what Christians celebrate at Christmas time. That our God became man in order to save us. And so we've been looking at, at different aspects of the identity of Jesus Christ. So a couple weeks ago, we talked about him as the Messiah, the one that God had foretold would come. Last week, we talked about his, his godhood, his deity, the fact that Jesus was fully God. And this morning, we're going to focus on the other side of that equation, that he is truly man, and the necessity that Jesus would be man for us to be saved. So looking forward to learning from the book of Hebrews this morning. And this passage and several other passages in Hebrews deal with this, this reality that Jesus had to be man in order to save us, that God as God uh, alone couldn't rescue his people, that he had to become man in order for that to happen. So that's the focus of our, our study this morning. Um, I'd like you to... Ask the Lord with me that he would illuminate his word before we begin reading in chapter 2, verse 14. So, Lord, we pray that you would reveal to us the glory of this word. Lord, illuminate our eyes so that we can see your glory, the God-man, our Savior. We pray that you would do that this morning, Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's begin reading Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Well, this last week, uh, we enjoyed a, a children's choir performance. Uh, some of the other folks in the church were there as well. And it was a delightful time, as children's choir always are, as ours was this morning. It was wonderful watching their enthusiasm. And I, I know there were, there were relatives, grandparents, and guests that were there, and I'm sure they enjoyed the performance just as a performance. Uh, but it seemed to me that the people who enjoyed it the most were the people who had <laughs> been most involved in the preparation, the, the children and the choir directors and so forth. Those who were most aware of all of the practice and sacrifice and effort, they seemed to be the most thrilled uh, at the actual celebration of the event itself. And I, I think that's true also of our salvation. I think that's true of our salvation. It's, it's when we understand the preparation, the, the background, the foundation, what, what preluded our salvation, that we can more fully enjoy the celebration of the grace of God. We might enjoy it just as a simple statement of fact, there is grace available for sinners, but the more we're aware of what's behind that fact, what was necessary for that fact to take place, for the, the prelude or the preparation of it, as it were. Th that's really when the, the full miracle of grace begins to be unveiled to us. One, one way you could say it is uh, the miracle of grace is revealed fully to us when we see the shock of the incarnation. The incarnation was necessary for the miracle of grace. Unless we're shocked by the, the incarnation, God becoming man. We, we won't fully grasp the glory of God saving us by his grace. That's what the writer of Hebrews is trying to get across. He does it in this passage, and then in, in subsequent passages, he makes the same point uh, with different angles, that it was necessary. It was absolutely essential 
for God to become man, without that fact, there was no salvation. And he dives into the necessity of the incarnation. He invites us to do the same. Now, there's basically two points in this passage. If you look down at, at uh, verse 14 and following, there's two main sections here. They, they have the same logic. Incarnation was necessary for salvation. And then they, they come at that from slightly different angles. And if you'll just pause just a moment and see if I can figure out what's happening here. Something very terrible. Let's see here. I promise I'm not doing anything electromagnetic. There's a little yellow light and it keeps blinking. It's terrible. I touch it and it breaks and they touch it and it's fixed. It's really... That's how you know you're a sound person if you can just touch things. Check, check. Nice. <laughs> Let's hear for Brian. <laughs> All right. I put those down just so I seem like I know what I'm doing. I, I can handle electrical equipment too, okay? <laughs> All right, let's dive in. Let's look at these two points, both making the same logical progression. The incarnation was necessary for the salvation. The first angle that the writer of Hebrews uh, brings to this topic, uh, we might label his victorious death. The victorious death of God the Son become man. Notice the logic in verse 14. Since therefore, and he's made the point that Jesus wants to identify with people. He, he wants to call them brothers. He's not ashamed of them. So that's, he's looking backwards. Since therefore, the children, the ones that he's called to save and connect with, the children share in flesh and blood... He's simply saying that human beings, those that God wanted to save, they have flesh and blood. They are human. They are men and women. They are not spirits like angels. They are human beings. Since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, the flesh and blood. He partook of them. That's what the Chalcedonian Creed was saying last week that the church fathers tried to summarize in that paragraph that, that God the Son took on a human nature. He didn't cease to be God. He added to himself a nature so that he exists, even as we read this morning in the Westminster Confession, as having two natures simultaneously subsisting in the one person of God the Son. So this is what the writer of Hebrews is saying. He partook of the same things, and here's why he had to do that. That through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and by destroying the power of death, deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Now, this is a, a, a complex progression of theological thoughts. And this is an epistle. It's not a story. So we've got to kind of track the logic with our minds. That's how letters work. They, they build on a theme. So let me, let, me, let me explain this section of the paragraph by, by working it backwards. Okay, that's one way you can, you can understand the logic of it. Look down at your, at your Bibles. And see if you can track this if we go backwards. First of all, under Adam, because of sin, every human being is a slave to the certainty of death. Every human being. There is no human being who is free, to use the language here, who is free from the certainty of death. And that certainty is like a slave master that holds its gruesome whip over their future. Every human being faces that slave master and is enslaved by death. This is his ultimate uh, uh, reality. It is a reality outside their control, and death is held over them, and the only way for this slavery and slave master to be conquered was for the penalty of death to be paid. And it had to be paid by a human. So he's importing a lot of biblical theology here. When God said to Adam and Eve, if you disobey me, you will die, that was a curse pronounced over all of humanity. 
that in rejecting God, they were ultimately rejecting their own freedom and entering into a curse that they could not get out of death would be held over their heads as sinners. And every human being was born into that curse. Because a human being had entered into that curse, a human being must pay the penalty of that curse. That's the logic of Hebrews. A human had to die for the curse of death to be reversed. But here's the dilemma. Because God was not human, he could not pay the penalty that sin required. Even if I can speak this way, so to speak, even if he wanted to, God, as God alone, could not pay the penalty of sin. And this is where we have to understand the biblical definition of salvation and not a common definition that's more like benevolence. So, so benevolence, you, you understand, it's, it's when somebody who has a certain amount of money gives a portion of that money to bless someone else. You might hear of a billionaire who gives away half of their fortune for causes that they deem helpful. They are benevolent. They give a portion. And we might think of salvation that way. God had this great treasure chest of grace and mercy, and he delved out a portion of it to help sinners and reverse the curse of death. But that is to misunderstand the nature of that curse. It had to be paid by death. That is the nature of sin. The wages of sin is death, not just pardon, not just the removal of it, not just the overlooking of it. There had to be a payment made. And so what the writer of Hebrews is saying is God as God could not pay because God as God is not human. And so a human has to die for that payment to be made. There was a very specific need. It had to be met by a human. So we could say it this way. He could not rescue his people from the de grip of death and condemnation. He had to die to save his people, but in his divine nature, he could not die. Nor could any other human die and pay for the curse because all of those humans were slaves of that curse. Their own death could only pay for themselves. The payment was death. The beneficiaries were sinful people. The interested party is an immortal being of infinite power and justice. And that is where the logic should end. It should end right there. Therefore, God, having done no wrong in this whole arrangement, allows people to get precisely what they deserve, and to face the curse of death. Even if his heart towards them was mercy, they had put themselves in a condition where the only one who could save them was a human, and God is not human, so they cannot be saved. The rules were clear from the outset. They chose to go against God and to face the ultimate and unavoidable consequences, the slave master consequences of death. And they were not free to have any other choice. They could not escape death. They did not have that power. But then there is the miracle that this paragraph begins by explaining. The logic did not end. What happened? He tasted death. Notice that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death. How did he do that? How did God, as God, destroy the death that could only be destroyed by a human dying? And that leads us all the way back to the beginning of verse 14. He partook flesh and blood, the same flesh and blood that belonged to those who were facing the curse of death. He partook that flesh so that he could die. Listen, we will not understand the glory of that middle phrase. He conquered the one who has the power of death. He delivered those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Unless we understand the miracle of that very simple opening phrase, he partook of the same things. God, the immortal God, partook of those things, not just for some kind of experience 
I think we might misunderstand sometimes the way incarnation is described, even in popular language. It, it almost sounds like God is this really wealthy individual, and he just wanted to feel what life was like for a human. That, that, is not, that is not what this is about. This is not, you know, a wealthy individual who decides, I'm just going to simplify my life and see what life is like in a simple condo with no car while I'm walking and taking the bus. No, no, that's a human trying to enjoy a different aspect of life. There is nothing about God that makes humanity appealing. There's, there's nothing beneficial to God or enjoyable to God about being made human other than the end of that humanity, which is saving humans from death. So the, the miracle of this passage is that he partook flesh in order to die. He didn't partake flesh to feel what it was like to be flesh. Let me encourage you to do something real quick. Just, just, just look at your own hands, just for a moment. Look at your own hands. Look at, at those ten fingers. Think for a moment. You can hold in your hands oh, perhaps, oh, I don't know, a few cubic inches of material. Think about that for a moment. These are, these are your hands. You can hold a few, you know, I don't know, a few cubic inches of material. F feel, if you can, just feel, feel your pulse. If you can't feel your pulse, let me know. Feel, feel, feel your pulse. <laughs> feel your pulse just for a moment. Think for a moment what this is saying. God, the infinite God, the unchanging God, the God with no physical limitations, the God who is everywhere present at every time, the God who is all-powerful, the God who sustains the universe, he took to himself ten fingers, a pulse, heart that pumps a few gallons of blood through the body. He took that to himself so that that pulse could stop beating, so that those hands could be stretched on a cross. Why did he take those small little fingers? So that they could cease to live. Why did he take a brain? so that it could turn off when he breathed his last breath. He took a body that could die so that he could have a body like yours that could die, so that he could pay the death penalty for people that were under the curse of death. For every human being, there will come a moment when our heart will stop beating. It will stop and there will be nothing we can do and apart from this passage and other passages like it, that death would lead into an eternity of experiencing death somehow in the mystery of hell and what that's going to be like. A an eternity of experiencing our own death over and over and over again. A, a, a spiritual death that is, is nothing but, but pain and torture and, and, and horror because of sin. And that's all that our body would ever have experienced. And so Jesus took on our flesh so that he could experience death. He took the same things, the same flesh, the same blood. His body was not someone superhuman. His body was not bulletproof. He could not see in the dark. He could not leap over buildings. He could not bend steel. Listen to this. He was not a superhero human. He was truly, simply, shockingly human. He took the same things so that the same kind of death that every sinner faces, under which they are enslaved by the devil, under their dreadful contract with death, so that he could take that death fully and set them free. So that the devil would have no death to hold over the people of God. The irony of the Incarnation is that it is precisely in the human weakness of God the Son and in the lowest point of that weakness, his actual death, that he conquered the devil and removed the threat of death for his people. His greatest power was displayed by those two hands strung out and pierced on a cross, by that human voice uttering its last breath, 
by that human heart giving its very last beat. In that death, according to this passage, he conquered. It, it pictures the, the devil as having the, the right of ownership over every human being. A, a, a sort of written contract of a death held over every human being. And it is as though when Jesus breathed his last, that contract disintegrated. Because that contract was based on the wages of sin being death. The death was paid. It was completed. It had to be a human death, and it was. And because he was also God, that human death was sufficient. It was sufficient for every human being who would believe in him. But the writer doesn't stop there. He wants to make sure that the same basic point from a different angle uh, is impressed on us so that we see the shock of the incarnation so that we can enjoy the celebration of God's grace. So he keeps going. We might call the, the second section his merciful mediation. His merciful mediation. Look down there at the, the way the passage continues. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. He's just making the point. He, he didn't help spirits who were in some ways similar to him in their spiritual being. No, he helped the offspring of Abraham who were physical beings. They were physical, flesh and blood, children, men and women, boys and girls. He didn't help a spirit being that were like him. He helped non-spirit beings that were unlike him in the fact that they had flesh. They were men. They were women. Therefore, because he had to help those uh, who had flesh, who were under this curse of death, therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of his people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. He had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Now let's just zero in on this phrase for a second. This was a divine necessity. Apart from God being made man, he could not die. Apart from God being made man, he couldn't become the priest that people needed. Now, we're not particularly familiar with priests, but we might be more familiar with the idea of a mediator. So a legal mediator is someone that stands between two parties that are in themselves incompatible. They cannot relate together apart from this person who is able to connect to both of them. That's the idea, the concept behind a mediator, very similar to that of a priest. It's very, very important that we understand. Men and women and God are completely incompatible because of sin and holiness. Very important that we understand this. If we don't understand this, we will minimize grace to something like niceness or benevolence. God and man are incompatible, more incompatible than any two parties in a civil court. Any two parties that judge rules, you must go to mediation. We need a third party who can try to relate to both of you. There, there's never been a mediation in human courts that were as incompatible as God, the Holy One, and people. There is complete incompatibility. They cannot relate together. For a sinful person, woman, man, to relate to God means instant condemnation. For God to relate to sinful human beings means their instant destruction. It can't happen. They are incompatible. So there was a job description that was needed called a priest. A priest was someone who could relate to God for people and people for God. But this priest, this job description was incredibly unique. He wasn't just like the Old Testament priests because they could only do it temporarily. And even then they couldn't do it perfectly because they could only sort of bring people close to God. They couldn't bring people right up to him. They were very imperfect mediators. So the ultimate mediator, the ultimate priest, had to be someone very unique. 
He had to be someone who could connect to God in his godness and men and women in their humanity. He had to be very unique. He had to be perfect so that he could relate to God without his own sin resulting in condemnation. He had to be human so that he could relate to men and women in their limitations and their weakness. Very unique, very unique job description. And so we might say that as the job description goes out, there is only one being capable of fulfilling that job description, and that is God the Son, if, if he becomes man. There is only one person in the universe, and that's the point of, of Revelation chapter 5, when it says, who, who is worthy, who is worthy, we might paraphrase, to become this priest? Who, who is worthy to become the mediator? Are you worthy to relate to God in your perfection and to relate to men in their weakness? Are you worthy to do that? Is there anybody worthy to do that? This is part of the reason why David and Moses, if you ever wondered why the scriptures make a very specific point of emphasizing their areas of sin. In spite of all of their heroic efforts, those great men, there are some sections of scripture that emphasize their areas of sin because the writers wanted to make it very clear as great as they were and as impressive as they were as a kind of mediator, they were not the ultimate one. There was a disqualifier on their application. A lot of it looked really good, but part of it meant disqualification. There is only one being who could fit every job description of this application to be the priest between God and men. He was God the Son, the eternal deity, and yet he became man, truly man, not just in the appearance of man, actually flesh and blood, so that he could be the one who could lay his hands on both of us, who could connect actually to both of us, so there could be a true reconciliation. So so that God's desired salvation for human beings could actually take place. Historically, theologians have called this the divine dilemma to try to help us understand. It, it, it is as if in his godness, God could not atone for sin. And so he couldn't find any human to atone for sin because they're all sinners. And so he came himself and became a man so that he himself offered himself for his own law to be fulfilled, his own wrath to be poured out so that human beings could have a representative who both paid for their sin and could usher them into God's presence. That's what this passage is saying. Therefore, look down at your Bibles. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. He couldn't be partially human because a partial human couldn't pay for humans' sin. He couldn't be partially human. He had to be like his brothers, like a human being, in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest so that he could fulfill this role. And here's the two elements of that priesthood. Here's what it is. To make propitiation, that means a sacrifice that satisfies the wrath of God. Very important theological word. A sacrifice that satisfies the wrath of God. All those previous priests, they could not fully satisfy the wrath of God because they weren't offering humans. And so Jesus offers himself the only sacrifice that could fully satisfy that propitiation, the human that fully received in himself the punishment of God for sin. To be a priest, he had to be able to offer that kind of sacrifice, and Jesus did. It had to be a lamb without blemish, which is what he offered. It had to have no sin of his own, which is what he offered. It had to be perfect in every respect and simultaneously human, and that is what he offered. He had to be made like his brothers so that he could be a priest and offer a perfect sacrifice and also, also, so that he could help those who are being tempted. No notice the second logic here about his merciful mediation because he himself has suffered when tempted. Look down there, verse 18. He is able to help those who are being tempted. The writer builds on this later in the, in the book as well. He's saying, look, there, there is a, 
a kind of knowing that God has about temptation that he has not personally experienced. It's almost a shocking phrase. Jesus is able to help us in our temptation, yes, because he's God and he's powerful and he has all the resources of the deity at his disposal, but also because he knows as a human what temptation, and particularly suffering temptations, and difficult temptations are like. Not just in a knowing the way we know about uh, the life of an ant or a fish. He knows it in the way a human being knows it experientially. And so this priest is able to relate to God in his perfection. He's able to offer a perfect sacrifice himself to pay for the people. And in their ongoing suffering with temptation, he's able to help those because of his own personal experience with temptation. The exact same kinds of temptation that they face. He had to be made like his brother in every respect so that he could be a priest so he could pay perfectly for sin as a human and so that he could help sinners as one who understands human temptation. That was the job description. As it were, God posts the description and there is only one being who can fulfill it, God the Son. And so, in the mystery of the Trinity, there is an agreement between them. Where the father d designs this job description, the son accepts it and comes to earth, takes on human form, and fulfills it perfectly and per permanently operates as this mediator, the God-man, between the Godhead and humanity, atoning for their sin and helping them in their time on earth in their ongoing weakness. And that's why that phrase, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, has to help us understand the miracle of grace. If we don't get the shock of the incarnation, the gift of it, the, 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 the amazing condescension of it, then we, we won't really appreciate that our sins are atoned for and there is mercy for us in our weakness. Again, we might think of that as this really rich guy in heaven that sort of helps us out from time to time without really noticing the cost. That, that, that is not the God of the Bible. He doesn't help us out of this big bank account with something he doesn't even notice as the money goes out to help this person and that person. No, he comes himself to take on our actual existence to experience it as surely and as truly as we do and so that he could pay for our sin and help us in our temptation. When we celebrate the manhood of Christ Jesus, we are celebrating that which was absolutely necessary and shocking for our salvation. Do we believe that phrase? Do we believe, do you believe that he had to be made like his brothers in every respect? Do we believe it? Do we, do we feel the miracle of it? Let's zero in on that phrase. It's, 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 it's part of the reason I picked this passage, that phrase. He had to be made like his brothers. He had to be in every respect. Feel the shock of that phrase. Feel the surprise of it. It, it, is, it is not like a, a, a great one temporarily experiencing uh, some limitation. This isn't like a rich person choosing to buy the small apartment or a person choosing to go without a car because they want to take the bus. This is not a middle-income American traveling for a couple of weeks in a third-world country and experiencing the temporary limitations of transportation and diet and care. This isn't, those are relative limitations. This is more like, more like a star operating as a flashlight. That phrase, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, it's, it's more like a star that chooses to simultaneously operate permanently as a flashlight while still being a star. This is an eagle inching along as a worm. This is a symphony buzzing as a kazoo. This is a soloist croaking like a frog. 
This is the divine, invincible lion without ceasing to be a lion, becoming a lamb. This is God the Son being made like his brothers in every respect. Now, there's nothing not wrong or undignified about the nature of man. It's actually superior to everything else in creation. But it is vastly inferior to the nature of deity as any comparison we can imagine. So when we read that he, God the Son, had to be made like his brothers in every respect, we must feel the shocking statement that is being made. And when we read he did this so that he could could be a priest to make propitiation, to face the same temptations, to be merciful to them, we must feel more deeply the miracle of our salvation. Let me use the the eagle and the worm comparison if I can. What kind of difficulties, imagine this for a moment, what kind of difficulties does a worm face compared to an eagle? Think about that. A worm, a worm is surrounded by winged predators. He's defenseless, sluggish, covered in dirt, and capable of only the most basic movements. Imagine that eagle functioning as a worm. And here we have God the Son learning the alphabet. Here we have the Word of God limited to his first few words. Knowing at most a few languages when he reached adulthood. Here we have him stumbling on a rock in the road, skinning his knee and bearing it with patience. Here we have him missing a meal and feeling hungry and faint. Here we have him, think about this, blinking in the hot noonday sun. Here we have him falling to his knees and bleeding drops of blood as he agonizes over his calling as a man. In every kind of temptation, in each and every one, he chose to obey so that he could make a perfect human propitiation for our sin. And he could have sympathetic mercy toward us in every suffering obedience. He had to be made like his brothers. I I, I want you to sort of iron that phrase into your brain for a moment. He had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Let me me read quickly a few passages of scripture and, and feel the miracle of these passages. Fear the miracle. We can't, I said last week, we can't understand the miracle of his humanity unless we keep in view his deity. We can't understand the grace of his deity unless we understand the shock of his incarnation. So so feel these phrases in light of that reality. Luke 2, Mary, Joseph's betrothed, who was with child. God the Son, in his human nature, in her womb, born of her substance, her son. She was not a surrogate. Her body contributed to his humanity. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus, listen to this, increased in wisdom he did not cease to be God in his divine nature he knew everything that could be known everything that has been known in his human nature he increased in wisdom and in stature and listen to this in favor with God and man
Matthew 4, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. John 4, Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting by the well. Luke 9, and Jesus said to him, foxes have holes. And birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Keep his deity in view. You can't understand the majesty of his humanity unless you remember, he is simultaneously the God-man. Divine nature, fully operational, and human nature subsisting in the same person of God the Son. If it doesn't stretch your brain, you're not looking hard enough. Matthew 26, he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Mark 14, 50. And they all left him and fled. Matthew 27, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? John 10, I thirst. John 19, it is finished. And he bowed his head, and gave up his spirit. Donald McLeod helps us understand some of the glory of Jesus' obedience as a man. He writes this, Never once does he in his own interest or in his own defense break beyond the parameters of humanity. He had no place to lay his head but he never built himself a house. He was thirsty, but he provided for himself no drink. He was assaulted by the powers of hell, but he did not call on his legions of angels. Even when he saw the full cost of kenosis, the emptying of himself that was the taking on of human flesh to exist in a human nature, He asked for no rewriting of the script. He bore the sin in his own body, endured the sorrow in his human soul, redeemed the church with his human blood. The power which carried the world, stilled the tempest, and raised the dead, listen, was never used to make his own conditions of service easier. Neither was the prestige he enjoyed in heaven exploited to relax the rules of engagement deploying no resources beyond those of his spirit-filled humanness, he faced the foe as flesh and triumphed as man. Christ was a man in his mind. He had to learn the truth of God and choose to believe it. He had to feel the temptation of mental laziness and not let it uh, become the lies of the devil in this world. He was a man in his emotions. He had to feel grief and loss and not let them become despair. He had to feel injustice and not let it become bitterness. He had to experience righteous anger against sin and not let it become arrogant rage. Christ was a man in his body. He had to experience hunger and the temptation to doubt God's provision. And he had to wait on his father's timing and will for his life. This means when Christ was a boy... He had to obey his parents, even though they didn't fully grasp his identity. It means when he became a brother, he had to care for his half-siblings, even when they sinned against him. It means that when Christ was a friend, he felt betrayed when his friends turned against him. He felt the pain of knowing the ones he loved would not stand with him in his deepest trial. It means when Christ was in the garden, every natural inclination of his flesh was dreading the cross. So that when he said, your will be done, he was saying it in your place and in mine. 
standing in for us to pay our debt and to understand our ongoing temptation to provide mercy for us as one like us. This means when Christ said it was finished, he was saying it as a human being. The way we would say a task is done. But this task was our rescue, our atonement, our salvation. Listen, the main point in all of those descriptions is to say we can't think of his deity as minimizing his experience as a man. He felt the nails as you would. He felt the abandonment as I would. He felt the lash and the mockery and the hatred as you would and I would. He felt the tug of ease and security and to go against the calling of God in his life the way you would. He did not use his deity to minimize the feel of that temptation. He didn't feel less hungry, even though he's the one who could give loaves to 5,000 people. He didn't feel less thirsty, even though he could offer living water to anyone who came to him. He chose to experience manhood, humanity, as you and I do. The miracle of salvation requires meditating on the shock of incarnation. The shock of incarnation. It was no less than God the Son taking on himself without restraint and without mitigation our own experience, walking in our place, dying for us, and continuing to live for us in human sympathy to our meekness. Because even in heaven, even in heaven, God the Son, still being God, retains his human nature. He continues as priest connecting to both of us. Symbolically, this is the point of the lamb imagery when you get to Revelation. That he is a lion, he is God, fully God equal to God the Father, the same substance of the Father and the Spirit, and yes, he retains his human nature as our mediator permanently, so that somehow in heaven you can perceive that that body, though glorified, was the body that died in our place. Somehow even his glorified body retains the mark of his vulnerable humanity, so that permanently everlastingly, God the Son can be seen as possessing a human nature that died for sinners. So that his shocking incarnation will be present and available to us for our worship through endless ages. We will never get over the shock of God became man. Consider, my friends, that the great choir in heaven... will be singing in view of this God, man. And we will understand more deeply than ever the reality of his humanity. We will see forever the truth before us that the word became flesh, took our sins, paid our debt, rose to conquer our curse and ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father in exalted glory as God the Son, the man Christ Jesus, who will raise his people to be with him and worship him in an endless celebration. And in that celebration, we will constantly be remembering the shocking truth that he left this to save everyone who would believe in him. As Augustine put it so well 1,500 years ago, man's maker was made man that the bread might hunger, the fountain thirst, the light sleep, the way be tired on its journey, that truth might be accused of false witnesses, the teacher be beaten with whips, the foundation be suspended on wood, that strength might grow weak, that the healer might be wounded, that life might die. And rising again, give life to all men and women 
who believe in him. He had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted and finally to bring them to glory. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would open our minds to grasp the heights and the depths of those amazing words that you became like us in every respect. Lord, thank you for suffering in our place. Lord, I I pray that the sufficiency of your death would comfort every person here convicted by sin. Lord, I pray that the sympathy of your mercy would comfort everyone here who is battling temptations. I pray that the glory of your incarnation would shock us We would not allow our minds to settle on some easier to understand explanation of this mystery. Help us to press into the glory of it, to see your glory in it. Now we're looking forward to that chorus. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive glory and honor, wisdom and power, wealth and blessing. Receive our adoration. In Jesus' name.